I hope that's just the perfect introduction to the person who gave me um, the only really, the only lead um, that I'd ever had in my career up until the point she walked into my life. And um, a, a, a character who I am still madly in love with, um, Tarek, uh, which I played for her, and um, one of the finest generals I've ever served under. Ruba Nada, are you there? Ruba, 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 I'm Ruba. here. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you look so healthy and happy. It's so well, I'm, yeah, I'm tanned. I've been gardening. I've been writing. It's, you know. Uh, it's we, like, we've communicated over email, but we haven't seen each other for years. And you are a sight for sore eyes, Ruba. Oh, you are too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, you've come into our den, into our, oh, into our little... What an awesome little, den. Wow. We, we, we are, we're like kids. We've kind of put the sheets up around the, the bottom of the bed and we've all climbed under it so no one can hear us play. Um, and we keep meeting like every couple of, couple of times a week. Um, and people were just dying to say something to you, to, to talk to you, because we've, you've been evoked um, several times. Um, so a few people have got some questions, probably. I want to do apologies to Sadig. I, I didn't know DS9 and I didn't know his work, um, but a dear friend of mine came to me and said, this is the best movie ever and you have to see it. And the uh -huh. nature of my friendship with her is such that when she says things like that, I obey. Um, <laughs> I watched it. Um, and now you have to forgive me, I'm still teared up over listening to that music, which I, I considered, uh, hadn't heard of Neil Byrne before the film either, um, but now I've followed his career because he's, he's just so exceptional. Um, so it's really, um, it was five years ago this week that I first watched your movie. Wow. I recall because we had a family event and my friend had come and so it feels fitting, but I literally, there's not a week that goes by in these last five years that I haven't thought about Cairo time in some way, shape, wow. or form. Wow, wow. I got feel it so exceptional because it just, it courageously asks such big questions and then equally as courageously doesn't try to provide big answers. It's got a big response, um, but not a big answer. Um, and so it's, um, you know, it's certainly not Roman holiday set in Egypt. Um, it goes in a very different direction. And in the reviews that I've read of it, I've often seen it compared to Brief Encounter. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's very high praise. Um, but I also just want to tell you, I believe it just surpasses Brief Encounter in oh, so thank many you. ways. <laughs> wow. Um, started because I was born in Canada, but my parents are Arab. And I remember landing in Cairo and being completely overwhelmed with sound and mm -hmm. it's like it's just an attack to the senses like visually um and just the sound of it and I remember just over the course of a few weeks the sound becoming just kind of backdrop with just what I was feeling in the process of it and so I wanted to really tell a story of this woman of, of landing and feeling completely overwhelmed and she's expecting her husband, husband doesn't show up. And then it's like just an assault to the tenses. But then at the same time, I think when she gets to the white desert, it, she becomes almost one with the, with, with her surroundings. And then the sound is like, it's like becomes part of her. And I think that's when she feels like that she, you know, in my head, that she could live in this country forever, to be honest. Um, the, but, sound is, the sound of it is amazing as well. And I mean, Neil Burns' score with just yeah. a brilliant use of light motifs. Yes. But what I also loved, I had never heard of Um Kultum, I'm, I'm embarrassed to yeah. say, until <laughs> I saw your movie. And I just thought, the, her voice of, you know, kind of a legacy Arabic pop sound or popular yeah. music sound. And then there was another popular singer who was so lovely. And then how you throw in the Everly Brothers at the end. Yeah. Like I, I hear that song now and I just weep. I'm, I'm, I'm right back in that taxi and I'm gone, you know? Um, and uh, it's just it's just a beautiful, beautiful mashup. And I, I'm, it's, it's curious to me the way you talk about this because one of my questions, 
I'm not a filmmaker. Um, I run a museum. <laughs> so nice. I, I do do visuals, but I, I run a museum. Um, and but you know, whenever I consume media, the soundtrack is already there as another character. Yeah. I, yes. I never really struck them out. A hundred percent, yes. yes. But when you're filming, and I, I'm I'm 55, so I'm filming like this. Right? Um, when you're filming, do you have all of that audio in your head? A hundred percent. From since I was, I started writing fiction, short stories when I was 13, and from a very young age, before I even started writing. I, it was like a music video in my head. I always, my dad um, raised me listening to classical music. So I have a love of opera and classical music. And I always have music playing in my head as I'm writing. It's really weird. And so it, it's actually really easy for me when I'm in the moment directing. It's like, I know kind of how this is all going to piece together the photos, you know, uh, because of that music. So it's like the tone just the mood and all like just the it's it's just there I, yeah. and I love that you I've never been asked that question oh so that's so like thank you well, I sing I, not I'd love to, I, an alto and I uh I've been in choirs my whole life and wow. I just I just can't I, I couldn't proceed I, if I walk down the street I'm hearing a song so I, yeah. I guess yes that, that, yes that. Yes. But I didn't know if it would be like that for someone who's doing a film, so. Yes. I'd yes. love to jump in very yes. quickly, just to say that, um, I never told you this, Ruba, but just about one of the, the point you just very recently made um, about uh, walking into the desert and becoming one with the uh, uh, environment and yeah. the adaptability of Juliet and what, um, what, what she was kind of a superwoman in a weird sense, but... Um, yeah. There's a massively autobiographical element to that for me, that, that script, because my mom went to Khartoum in Sudan uh, in 1964, 63, um, and met my father there, and then stayed for three years and learned Arabic and learned the culture and learned how yeah. it all worked. And there's a real parallel between Tarek uh, and, uh, um, and those two characters. Yeah. Uh, with my own mother's life, which is what I, which I really oh. responded to. Um, but that's kind of interesting because she, she, I feel that she was adaptable to any, she was a model. She was, for the, she you know, was. Christian, absolutely. She did all these different things in her life. Yeah. And then, and you made a movie about her. That's yeah. Pretty amazing. And I think that's why she, like part of, you know, that Everly Brothers at the end of a movie, I think that's what snaps her awake and she realizes she mm. never going to see Tarek again. You know, so it's like the use of music, you know, if yeah. you really want to get deep into it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's also storytelling, right? Like the yeah. choice of music Absolutely. that you put in, 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what a wonderful storyteller you are. <laughs> Both the aesthetic and the characters of your movie are fluid, elegant, mesmerizing. It hit me twice. First, right after watching Cairo Time for the first time, I felt like crying for a week. Of course you get attached to Tarek and Juliet. Of course you want to see them happy. It hit me a second time, much later, probably a year or so. Juliet is a brilliant woman. She's curious, open-minded, empathic. And unlike in any other romantic film where you'll see your hero fight for what they want, she decides to settle for what she has. From her, this beautiful bright lady, I learned that sometimes trying to make things work is not the coward's thing to do. Whether it's about companionship, friendship, or even work. It also takes courage to stay because who wouldn't want to elope with Tarek? <laughs> and basically, um, uh, the person before uh, <laughs> asked uh, the questions that Alex had in some shape or form. Uh, basically, um, Alex was also stricken by the music. And that landscape had replaced the words between them. So the question was whether you already knew the music as you were shooting and you responded to that. So this is great. 
And then the second question Alex had was that she loves Egypt, but Cairo is her least favorite city in the world. <laughs> she finds it oppressive and overwhelming. And as you said, the noise, I've never been, but I can imagine. <laughs> um, so her question was, how was it to shoot in the chaos? Oh my God. <laughs> said <laughs> it was crazy it was I, I've said this before and it's still true it felt like we were shooting an action film because <laughs> like it looked so calm like the frame looked so calm and around the frame it was like it was crazy it was crazy I mean but I have to say like it was extremely liberating because it was so alive like you had to be so in the moment you have to be so present because it was so even for me and i'm an arab i know how to speak the language i'm fluent i know the customs and even for me it was a culture shock because it was so it's so different than anywhere else around the world but i think i think what made it absolutely possible were the people the people were so kind and they were so willing to help and they were so proud of their city that it was just alive. And so we as, as a crew and our beloved cast, we just had to go with it. And I was very lucky that I had uh, such a good, strong team of people around me that they were just willing to just go with it. So, you know, it, it, oftentimes we couldn't control the locations. Like we didn't have 100% control of a lot of the locations that we were shooting in. And we just had to be like, okay, how do we make this work? You know, how do we talk to the, the public? Like, how do we convince them? How do we just, you know, it was like a puzzle. And I remember finally getting on the plane to come back home and breathing a sigh of relief that we just pulled it off because it was, it was like every single day we were like, is this possible? I don't think so. How do we? Like, how I do we saw Ruba in action. I saw yet. Ruba actually doing this and you know, directing this thing. And the, the camera was pointing at a scene and there was either myself, uh, Patricia, or some other actor do, trying to do a scene in some sort of quiet sort of way. And the street around us would be full of people. I mean, it was like a weird vacuum of quiet in this little area where we were acting and the rest of the city was blaring and hooting and there were people trying to get into the shot and literally just busting to get in there. And to watch Ruba change from talking English to us about how maybe we should be shooting the scene to suddenly erupting in Arabic to some man and going, you need to shut up or leave. And these guys who were pretty misogynist, you know, getting told by this woman exactly to be just completely schooled by Ruba. And she did it time and time again. She just was so fierce. She just took that set and owned it. Um, and that was really interesting to watch. I mean, I know my wife, Shana, who goes back with Ruba, because Shana was an associate producer on, on uh, Cairo Time, is, was so impressed with Ruba being able to do that, that she could just turn into this harpy and scare the living daylights out of 40 Egyptian men like that. <laughs> Otherwise, we would never have made the movie. We couldn't have made it if, if Ruba wasn't so fierce. <laughs> True. Remember, the last, I mean, there, remember the last scene, Sid? Like, they're, they're, the last scene of the film, and it's this emotional, beautiful scene, and I was just trying to protect their environment and give them the space, and, and there was this truck behind us we were we were towing the taxi and there was a truck behind us and they kept beeping and they were it it, it was just it was just a nightmare it was like oh and and the, the other thing too said i don't know if you remember this but i remember the first day we show up in cairo and be, it's because of the heat the heat is very oppressive and we're just used to people getting into fist fights and then by the end we're just used to it and it was just, it was, it was the most unique experience we've ever, ever experienced. It was wild. And, and we wild. got in before the Arab Spring and before Cairo just yeah. rampled itself. And that uh, before it just, we wouldn't be there. We could never, we could never shoot a film like that again. That's not no. possible. It was that not one moment. One. No. It's not a new time. So the first one actually goes to the both of you. Um, because I can't talk about Cairo time otherwise I won't stop talking because I love it a lot. 
Um, oh. So, and the, the characters, and I mean especially Sid's characters, because uh, obviously of racial stereotypes and stereotypes of masculinity, they're very different in, um, in uh, Inescapable as well, because you, you manage to combine so many different aspects of, of characters, character traits that are usually not combined in the movie world. So um, Sid's characters in, in both movies are really refreshing and very unique. And I think that makes the movies very special, actually. Thank especially, you. Especially, especially just seeing um, an, an Arab man in a, in a role like that. In a, in yeah. a, I don't think I've ever found another movie that was just having a romantic lead like this. And I really love that, um, especially in the setting and everything. So we were wondering how deliberate were you breaking up those stereotypes or was it just, I'm writing these characters no matter what? And for Sid, um, if you want to talk about that as well, how it was for you to play these characters, because you talked a lot on the past Zooms how boring it is for you to just play the stereotypical terrorists and such. Well, for me, I. I the this Arab man is the, this is a man that I know, and so uh, when I first started writing about of Tarek, like he was just real to me because I he he's my father, you know, like this is this is a man that I grew up with. Um, but selling the movie was you know selling the script and trying to get it financed. It, definitely, people, and I, don't, I it, honestly I don't know if it's even changed that much. Like de definitely, people have. A very different per perception of what an Arab Muslim man looks like, and so it, it's very you, interesting to me. But I mean, I I've grown up with men like this, and so for me, this is what I knew, and I was really adamant to protect him. I, I remember early on, actually, a financier saying to me, "You know, you, you have to do something violent that would shock her, that would do." And I was like, "Violent? Are you insane? I can't. I'm not doing that." And I really was so protective of this character that he's just a, he's a gentle man, but he's also very strong and very masculine. And I felt like it was just a very different perspective that I, I, I hadn't ever seen before in film or television, actually. Um, yeah, it was a real privilege to, to, to play him. I was very lucky that Ru Ruba um, uh, asked me to get involved and, it, it really allowed me to sing a song that I never really got to sing before. And that's really what I enjoyed about the part. And, and, and there's a bit of bit, uh, since the 9-11 time, there's been a bit of a mission to humanize Arabs by me. I've been really trying to get people in, get into people's living rooms, get into people's theaters and introduce them to a different kind of guy than the screaming guy you saw on TV yeah. and CNN back in the day. I remember it was always, Oh, oh, yeah. oh my god we're not all like this and um to get someone who you would happily introduce to your sister or your mother or your brother or your you know you know leave with your your kids with for half an hour while you go and buy something and that was really important to make him just like you and me and not like you were saying not this machismo thing um, but that, I, 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 I got to work with what I've got, so I can't do matcha. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty silly for me to try matcha. So I, I was never, I was never born with the macho thing, you know. So it was always smart for me to play against that type. Uh, in answer to that part of your question, um, to really explore the other half of me, um, uh, which is. I, I dare say feminine, but it's it's the other the other part that's always present in me. Um, it, I don't know. I don't want to be controversial, but I just love. I'm always introducing myself to that person, and um, if I get a, a role where I can be an, ambiguous like that, it's wonderful. I think masculine and feminine in those senses for, for people on on screen just get very liquid uh, when you've got the people you find really sexy, you know, because. They're always being, woo, always surprising me that way. Thank you. Oh, so Ruba, thank you for, like, obviously it was your project, so you had a lot of heart in it, but I'm really grateful you stuck with this and protected these characters so well, because the film you. is so absolutely worth it. Thank I'm you. so grateful you made these movies and show these cultures. 
So, and, and that's also, I need to, I have the questions written down because I knew that I'm going to be a bit all over the place. So this is a double question a bit. Um, so looking back, because I have only seen Cairo time in Inescapable, but looking back at your career now, which would be your favorite scene watching now, just by watching, and what's your favorite memory on set? And Sid, if you want to oh. in with the project as well. Well, my baby is Cairo time. It's just, it's like I hear, I just hear a snippet and then it's like, it takes me back. I think my favorite scene, my favorite scene would have to be the pyramids when they're on the pyramids and they're just sitting there next to each other. It was so beautiful and so, such an accomplishment for me because it was so, the, those pyramids are older than us and, and will be there for longer than, it was just such a beautiful moment and and at the time I, I i remember alexander patricia and i going we can see a police officer galloping on a horse towards us and they're going to shut us down so we have to we have to film this scene very quickly so they're sitting on the <laughs> remember that, like the police officer seeing us and then galloping on the horse towards us to be like get the off the pyramid. We stole every scene in that movie. You had to steal that. every scene. I love that you say that. We did every single scene. We stole it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My, fa my favorite, favorite scene was my first Ruba. Um, really? I don't, know if, I don't know if you remember. It was because as an actor, I, I, once I once it's done, once it's once it's in the can for you to do with what, make your next movie with. Because uh, there are always two movies, the one we shoot and the one director edits. Yeah. And uh, they're completely different. Um, but the, my first day, which is the only way I can describe it, because in watching it, I don't like watching myself on screen, but um, I came in, it was a scene in Juliet's hotel room. And there was very little said. And we went, walked out onto the balcony and we saw, it was a lot of sexual tension. Do you remember that? Yes. That, that was, was your my first, first scene to film? Day. That was my first you know that was my I, tried, I tried to change it, by the way, and I got shot down. It was difficult. I don't know why. And that was such a, it was such, by the way, you know how famous that scene is? Everybody talks to me about this scene about, but by the way, that was all spontaneous, you guys. All, like the way she walks to him and he walks to her and then they separate and then they walk. Remember? That was all yeah. spontaneous. Absolutely, it was, it was terrifying, and I'd never met Juliet before, and it was like, right, instant sex, instant chemistry, go on, instant. off you go. Instant. And I was like, wow, actually, we can do this. This is great. Yeah. This is happening. We're doing. We're dancing here, and we that just. That was the first. That was your first. And I remember Danny, our producer at the time, turns to me and he's like, "Oh, thank God, you have a movie. They've got great chemistry. You have a movie." And I was like, that's the first scene. That's his first day. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. I feel like that explains so much about the chemistry in that film. Yeah. You started at that point and then we yeah. gone from there. Honestly. <laughs> yeah, we started at the top. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that scene is really gorgeous. Um, I don't wanna I don't wanna be the bad interviewer. Can I ask something else? Is that okay? Yes, yes, of course. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so we were wondering about the budgets because I don't think that you've had like several big billions <laughs> to make your movies, but it did a, you did a really good job. So I studied film and uh, Marlo yeah. is a filmmaker as well. So we had quite a lot of talks about that. One of them would have been the guerrilla filming because we learned to, how to do that in London, basically. So I wondered, yeah. but that must have been, yeah, that must have been even more chaotic. So we, it was chaotic. I mean, we were, we were lucky. We had, like, it was about four and a half million Canadian, mm -hmm. but the Canadian dollar went, goes very, the dollar goes very far, far in Cairo. So we were lucky. I mean, the locations really helped because we didn't have to, you know, the, the, where they go, the Atarik's coffee shop, for example, that I walked in and I was like, oh my God, there's no direction that you can't shoot in. It was just beautiful, the walls, the texture. So that really pushed our budget further. Mm. But at the same time, because our budget was so tight, there was no room for error. Because at the time we were shooting on, on 35, 
print middle millimeter and the 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 woman she was like a what do you call it? a censorship woman she would sign on the exposed uh tape her signature that was allowed that would allow us to take the the prints and then ship it back to canada so we could not afford to lose like an hour of footage so that that when sid says we stole every single scene we really did <laughs> like <it's, laughs> it was really crazy was there um in in both movies and inescapable as well were there very specific scenes that gave you a headache before like when planning but also while they were happening where you got really nervous about doing it you know what Cairo time i was blessed i really i was really blessed like every single scene at like as a writer when i'm writing i'm like oh my gosh i really hope i can just shoot this scene and then as a director it's like can I shoot it? Like, am I going to be able to go, you know, because the, the, the Mina house, for example, where they, um, Patricia goes and watches the golf that was closed. And so at the time I was like, well, I don't care that's closed for renovations. I still have to shoot there. So how am I going to, who am I going to have to talk to, to convince to shoot there? So things like that, where I was like, I just had no idea if I was going to be allowed to shoot at the pyramids or at the white desert or, you know, the Shepherd Hotel, like it, all these locations that I had written that my hopes were, had, were so like praying that I would be able to pull off, we pulled off. And so I was really, with that movie, I just, it's such a blessing when I look, when I watch it, because every single scene that I wrote, we did it. Like we got the location and we convinced and we connived and we fought and we got it. But, you know, sometimes you, you don't get lucky and you don't, you know, for Inescapable, we initially wanted to shoot that it's set in Damascus. We can't shoot in Damascus, but we want to shoot in Jordan, like an Arab country. And then at the last minute, we just couldn't go to an Arab country and we ended up shooting in Johannesburg. So, and that was really difficult, like to be able to pull that off, you know, like the casting, the extras, the so that's what I mean with like Cairo time is kind of like lightning in a bottle. It's like we pulled it off. <laughs> it's like thank yeah. God. I mean, Inescapable was kind of interesting because it brings up something that very rarely happens in a movie um, or when you're shooting a movie because the, predict the predictability of a script is yeah. all you need to worry about in a movie. You've got a script, you know, we're going to shoot it and you shoot it. Yeah. But Cairo time, I mean, Inescapable, while we were just finishing, just beginning, just beginning to start mo fin uh, filming. The Arab Spring happened in Damascus. Yeah. At exactly, in exactly the last four weeks before we started filming. So you, what can you do? You can't rewrite a script because you've already bought all the locations. You've spent all the money. So the script is locked. You cannot do anything. And then you go, well, how do we incorporate this new politics into this? And you're, when you're on the budgets that we're, we were on, you just simply can't do it. You just can't go and change, change everything around. And I know, you know, Marissa was really upset that uh, yeah. we, we couldn't just flip a switch and take, make the whole movie really political. Because obviously politics was unfolding in front of us as we were speaking. People were dying in Damascus. Yeah. It all sorts of things, but that was that shows the real limitation of, of making a movie. It's like a ship, you just cannot turn it around really quickly. Yeah. Unless you've got millions and millions and millions of dollars. And that was a really interesting thing that happened with Inescape. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm a screenwriter. Uh, originally, I'm Nubian from Sudan, north of Sudan. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. And like Sid, I was only born there and, and I left, I grew up between Europe and the Middle East. And now I live in Dubai. I've uh, been living here for the last 10 years. And, uh, and the, 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 it's my first screenplay. Um, and the story is also partially in, in Egypt. It has a lot of, it's basically about the uh, River Nile. So it was very interesting to me to hear what, how, with all the, the things that went, or your experience basically on filming in Egypt. Um, and, I mean, my story is about the, the people who are displaced because of the high dam of Aswan, which are the Nubian. And at the same time, um, the, the, the problem that is coming up now with the new dam in, in, um, in Ethiopia, the blue, the, blue, the blue dam, the blue Nile dam. The, it's called yes. the 
So, and also it's a lot of cultural and religion into it because the protagonist is originally from the very rare um, Jewish Nubian who were there and Jewish Ethiopian. And, um, and, but it was also so interesting to hear um, what you're talking about, how to portray the people from the, from the region, how to give them the image because both the protagonist and the, um, uh, and the villain are in the story are from the, from the region. So it's basically uh, shows both, um, um, I, don't, I don't know how, both perspectives basically. Yeah. And so I'm looking into partially producing it. I'm not as, as the genius as Ruba, I cannot, I cannot, I don't think, I don't see myself directing at all. So I'm fine with writing only. And so uh, it's a matter of championing it and bringing it to, um, to, uh, to the public, to investors, especially here in the region. Um, I was wondering what, from your experience, uh, uh, Alexander or, or Roba, how do you champion your, how do you bring, especially if it's political, religious, and cultural, um, and I see it very topical, especially now with the pressure of the, the water issue uh, in the region. How do you bring it to, um, uh, how do you bring it to investors? How do you bring it to that's a good question for Ruba, because she's fought this fight. You know, it's really hard. It is really hard. It, I think you have to have perseverance. I think what really helps is if the story is personal, you always have to, people really love to hear passion and yeah. dedication and your, like your, how it, your personal history. Yeah. Uh, that's a part of the feature of, of, of like the story that you're trying to tell. And I think that yeah. if you can be like passionate and emotional and consistent, consistency yeah. is actually really important because yeah. I find that there are so like people have people who don't know about the region or about the culture, they have like a lot of misconceptions and, and at the same time they feel like, you know, everybody has an opinion and everybody is a critic. And so it's really hard to like maintain, like even when I was trying to tell Kyra time, like it was really, I, I knew exactly the, to the the story that I wanted to tell the characters, the, just like the point that I was trying to make. And so many people had thoughts, ideas, and they will try to dissuade you and get off the path. And it's, you've got to really just be very focused and it's it's kind of like Alexander. I, like I, I've always wanted to ask you this. Like when you're when you're when you play Tarek, like how did you how do you maintain that beautiful consistency of this is who I'm playing and this is what I'm what I'm the choices that I'm making and because there's so many people I find um, in your ear a lot. So mm -hmm. it, I just as a writer, as a director, as a you know, like it's really it's. I feel like you just have to be very you can't forget what the single thread idea is like that yeah. part of what the story that you're trying to tell. And yeah. I also feel like people love to hear the passion and yeah. the personal side of it. And I feel like that is like you're kind of mule taking everybody. Abs forward. Absolutely. I mean, you've got uh, the, the thing that um, to answer your specific question, you know, when you were young, when I was young, or oh, when, when, I mean, really young, like in your teens. We were young, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when um, you, remember when you kind of berated yourself if ever you did after a night because you were maybe attracted to someone and you just went, God, I wasn't myself. I was, I was forced to being someone else. I shouldn't have been someone else. I shouldn't have tried to be someone else. Yeah. And that's when, when you're acting, you must always never be someone else. Um, and yet the irony is you're, in order to be someone else authentically, you really do have to be yourself. And you must never sort of put on any kind of fake yeah. stuff. Um, so that's how you keep consistent and, um, and consistent within a role because you, you just don't pretend like you did when you were a kid and you were trying to protect, impress someone. So you don't try and impress, maybe that's the thing. And I think from, for, for your, for your um, uh, question, Maria, I think that, um, You've got to 
try and find a champion and that champion will be a, a director. That's good. And Sudan has given, um, has just given birth to a couple of really wonderful new directors and they're, they're winning awards. And uh, I know that there's uh, two, two Sudanese directors, one docu for documentaries, I think the other for drama, have just joined the Academy this year. Yeah. And um, they, these are the people you've got to try and reach. Ruber is right, consistency and passion and uh, a, the vision of a, to see a good director. And that's, that's, that will guide you in the right place. That just that one, but Ruba, don't forget, you're talk, looking at a man, woman um, who's right in front of you there, who yeah. is the most persistent. She is just will not let go. She yeah. just does not stop. And if anything, Ruba is viciously persistent. You know, they talk about uh, Elizabeth Warren here and yet she persisted. And Ruba does that. She does not let go. And she just shakes and shakes and shakes the trees until something falls out. And uh, you need that drive. You need that kind of drive. Yeah. So um, that, that's a very hard thing, especially for Sudanese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've never lived in Sudan. <laughs> so that's the challenge, yeah. It's the challenge. But... Um, I was just curious more of her thoughts because I'm writing a thing for an, a, a thing about anime music, but it's about sort of the interplay between director and composer and um, screenwriter. So um, I was kind of curious, like what she had to say about, you know, how she works with composers and how she um, envisions the soundtrack and places at various places. I hope I'm getting somewhere with this. Uh, no, no. Yeah, I look I I love working with the composer. Like I love Niall and it was, I'm very, look, I don't know. I would, I can't imagine ever knowing how to compose something, but I'm very good at knowing whether it should start with the piano or violin or, and so it was really fun to um, be able to work with the composer that way. And to be like, oh, I need something slowed down. I need something speeded up. But I think the, you know, the score should start here. I, I remember we had a really hard time figuring out how the movie should start because it just starts such a bang. Um, but it's, and the other thing too is, is you're basically, you're really telling a story with the score that you have. And um, sometimes less is more. You know, so like when, you know, we're at the white desert and sometimes you just want to hear that silence, you know. Um, but music is such a big part of my life, like everyday life. Like I, I wake up to the sound of music. I go to sleep with the sound of music. It's so weird. I'm like, I feel like I'm in a, my own musical all the time. Um, and, you know, like if I hear like a score I, I immediately I can be like oh I'm so depressed and like, it just gets me in the mood immediately um so I just for me like it, working with the composer is is crucial you know because so, need what's your, can I ask a question about what your yeah. first meeting with the UK so you've, you've you've gone to all these lengths to choose the composer you've you've yeah. got a few samples from different composers and you've gone you know what I just like this one's voice yeah. Um, and then you email a few times to go, you know, hi, hi. So what was your first meeting? What is your, what do you, what do you do? How do you begin the process of Thanks, creating? Because I think that was kind of my, kind of what I was well, trying to ask. So, you know, here's the secret about filmmaking. So when you're cutting a movie, when you're editing a movie, you always lay in temp tracks, temporary tracks. Um, the temporary tracks that I laid in to Cairo time, I remember my editor came and visited us in Cairo and she cut the scene with Alexander and Patricia on the bridge. And I remember saying, here, take this piece of music from Jan Tiersen, who, uh, he's a famous French composer and, you know, he did Emily. He's, his stuff is gorgeous, beautiful. And so what I did was I, te I tempted a lot of his soundtrack, like his his, he's got a lot of albums that it's just very dreamy and subtle. And so I tempted in a lot of that, his score. And so immediately I knew that I wanted piano because it was like, I, I just, for some reason, it felt like that was 
Juliet and Tarek's kind of theme. I could just hear it. And so the, the temp um, score was very telling in the mood that I was trying to achieve. And that's how I was able to communicate with like finding the right composer for the movie and like explain like this is the kind of score that I'm looking for because I, I'm not a music. I'm very, you know, the way I talk about music is very primitively, you know? So it's, it's like, how do I communicate? This is the, the tone, the ember, the feeling that I want to convey. And so the way you do that quickly is the temp track, but at the same time, a temp track can really m be misleading sometimes because it can be very wrong. And, you know, so it's, it's a very tricky uh, job. So sometimes your composer will just uh, come back and say, you know what, I disagree completely with your temp yeah. track and yeah. I'm going to go big with this. And yeah. you went, no, 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 really quiet. And you heard yeah. it and went, wow that kind of works. Is that yeah. what you do or do you get yeah. like, no? Yeah, I was that I wanted a soundtrack that was going to be like calm and simple and deep and moving. And I, so I, I wanted simplicity because I knew this sound, the soundtrack of Cairo was bustling and crazy and loud and fast and frenetic. And so I knew I needed some, like a soundtrack that like the composed music that was going to be just a punch in the gut. Yeah, yeah I, yeah. sorry. Um, I really love the juxtaposition in the soundtrack between the piano stuff and the um, Arabic music, um, and especially how it often feels like the latter is kind of ambiguous in terms of if it's diegetic or not, um, and adds to that sort of walking around the city feel, which is, which is the thing I really loved about the movie, by the way, because I'm one of those people who, when I go to a new city, just loves to just like wander. And I, I love how the film captures that like so well, like just the joy of discovering a new place. Thank you, thank you. And, and also one, one thing I, I wanted to say is I, I was wondering, um, it possibly tied in this, where you get the idea to make Tarek a former composer because that was also me as an undergraduate. I studied composition and then took four years to realize I wasn't very good at it, so. Wow. I mean, <laughs> I should have, right? <laughs> I should have, like, that's a, that's a, that was, that's a good idea. I mean, you know, the, the thing is, is that, um, it's funny, like Cairo is known for their music. You know, they're known for their cinema and their music. Like that's where uh, historically like class the classical Arab music originated from. And so everybody in Cairo sings, like they, everybody can carry a tune and everybody can hum and everybody. So it's like Cairo is like a bubbling, bustling, like meld of, like, and that's what they were known for. And I think that's the, for me, the love of Cairo, that's where it originated from because I grew up watching those classic movies and, you know, M. Kultum and Abdul Hanim Hafez and like all those very classic singers. And, um, you know, and so it's like, I feel like an Egyptian, that, 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 that's, it's kind of in their blood, you know, the music is in their blood actually. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, I have recommendations. Um, if anybody's interested in the culture, um, one of the wonderful uh, a writer called Nagib Mahfouz, who is an, oh, an I, Egyptian. I love, uh, sorry, I, I read one of his books in high school. I loved it. That's, I recommend them to, that any of his books are wonderful. Um, and I highly recommend them. And there's a Sudanese writer, there's only one world famous Sudanese writer called Talib Saleh who, and I probably massacred his name, um, as Maya probably like, it's not how you pronounce it. Um, but uh, he wrote a book called Seasons of Migration to the North. And he kindly sent me a copy before he died, but he was just one of the most, what, he's just written one of the most beautiful books. And uh, it's, a, it's one of the worlds. If the world produced books and you had to read books from the world, it would be in the top 50 world books um that's how good it is um so uh, that just throwing in those recommendations of people who want to get underneath underneath um the, the, this culture and of course in Khartoum, 
Um, and who did, who was the other name you said, um, uh, Ruba? Uh, Abdul yep. Fame Hafiz. It's he's oh, famous. Oh, oh, he's, he's so famous. wonderful. He's wonderful. He's so wonderful. Yeah, that's another person you should just put on and just he'll make yeah. you start dancing in the kitchen. Absolutely. I know. I, I've loved. I've loved the theme of today. <laughs> I love loved it. <laughs> yes, it's been great. This is what we do every, every like twice a week. Ruba. We just hang out and shoot the breeze. Um, and sometimes we get a little bit rock and roll. You know, we'll talk about some contentious thing. But most of the time, we're just finding out what's going on, and uh, it's, it's always such a pleasure. Um, that and, and this is unusual because this you're the most important thing here today. Well, you're not, but you're you're the most important thing for this particular Zoom. And we need to know more about you because I haven't seen you for years. And uh, listening to someone as brilliant and talented as you, and a dying breed, an author who is Aww. also an, an Arab woman uh, and uh, is uh, one of the most encouraging signs. So we just hope, um, you know, you get, make lots more movies. I've already said yes for the next Thank one. Thank you. So that's done. And I haven't even seen the script. So you can actually write something. 